story. So uh, I think uh, I think Alice made a good point of that in, in the book. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, oh, um, your father. How long how long did your did your your folks live in Howard County before you moved when you were around eight years old? Seven years old? They were born here in Howard County. Uh, my father was born here in Howard County. Uh, in Coolsville, it's near Law. My mother was born in Ellicott City. Mm -hmm. How did how did they meet? How did they meet? Oh boy, <laughs> I couldn't tell you that. I, I really don't know. I really don't know. No. I, I really don't know how they met. No. What's your father do? He was a butler. He was a butler. He worked in private family. Uh -huh. Here in the county. Uh, Baltimore City, Baltimore County, Green String Valley, and places like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, is that the only thing he ever did? What, what other things? Well, he did some farming, you know. He was a minister. Huh? He was a minister. Well, yes, yes, he was a, a local minister too, uh, and he did some farming when he, you know, could do it. You know, most of the time it was left in the hands of the sons to take care of it. You know. What, uh, what kind of minister was he? He was a Methodist uh, minister, a local minister here in Asbury. That's right down here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's still, still... It's a church is still there. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, let's see. And um, I think you said on um, in your interview with Alice that uh, one time he, he helped to build the mill in Savage, is that right? Yes, yes, he did. Yes, he did in his early, early days. Uh, he helped to build that mill in in, uh, in uh, Savage here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did he do other kinds of work like that too? Did he do other construction work and, and uh, as well as farming and? Yes, yes. But he didn't do too much. Didn't. This was his early in the beginning of his marriage life when he worked at uh, at laborers as a laborer. But most of the time he worked in private family. He was a butler. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, let me ask you about um, businesses in the area. Now, now, you you have a business, do you not? I have a business, yes. Can you tell me about it? Well, we have a business, and um, we employ we employ about anywhere from. And I continued to carry it on in the Harmon. And now I have with me three sons who works with me. And uh, of course, I don't do any, any of it no more. I just, you know, supervise or, you know, uh, make up contracts and stuff like that. And uh, what kind of business is it? It's a masonry business, a concrete business, a concrete business. Mm -hmm. Where's it located? Well, we we're out of here. This is the office out of here. Oh, yeah. Downstairs, the office is here. But we work all around in Howard County, and Randall County, Baltimore City, Washington, Montgomery County. We work like at Annapolis. We work most everywhere. When you started your business in the, in the middle '40s, were there were you aware of, of other blacks in the area that also had their own? Business? Yes. And what were they? Yes, they were doing the same type of work. Yes, I think the uh, Matthew brothers. And then there were some in this area that uh, also started in the business. But now, I don't think those who started around here, like uh, it was another moor down the road, it lives right down the road from here, he's no longer in business. And then there was a fellow by the name of Mason. Uh, he's no longer, of course, he's passed. He passed. And it might have been a few more. But the Matthew brothers were in Anne Arundel County. And they had a business there. And of course, most of them uh, are, are still in business. They're still in business. Yeah. Do you remember much about the county when you were very small before you moved away for the first time? Do you have any memories? No, I don't have too much. I, I can't say too much. I, I only know when we moved from here that we lived on Mission Road, just below uh, the hill going down near the tracks, just along in that area there. It was um, one house there. And that's about all I can remember, you know, because I was real small when we moved.
Mm -hmm. Now, Mrs. Moore, when, when you came first came to the county, then was after you were married, right? Yes. In, in the middle 40s. Or, mm -hmm. or, or, you said 1940, right? Mm -hmm. okay. um, you have a large family, do you not? Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Nine children. The Nine oldest days. is uh, deceased. We have four boys and four girls now. What's it, what's it like raising a large family now, Kevin? Well, at the time it was a little rough, but now it's, <laughs> it's fun now because they're all grown. Uh, Valerie, we just saw, is the youngest, and uh, the oldest would have been 48 in November. So uh, now it's fun. It was all work then, and it was fun too. You know, we I'd play ball with them, and uh, we just had fun. I, I sort of grew up with them. What sort of activities did you all enjoy doing together as a family? As a family? Hmm. In the old days when, every, when, when the kids were still young. Oh, we played baseball a lot. And um, horseshoes and croquet. And um, there was checkers and dominoes. And that was before television. And then after television came, you know, then a lot of those things disappeared. But they're starting to come back. Uh, just this past Christmas, we um, had a hot domino game and a hot checker game going. <laughs> just this past Christmas, and of course we did win, lose, a draw. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> is, that, is that on television too? Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, that's where we got it from. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, that's right. Um, tell me. Oh, I know what I wanted to ask about. Um, as soon as I can find it. Um, Tubman High School. How important was Tubman High School to your family and your children? It was very important because it was the first high school that was here in the county for black kids. Um, before they had Harriet Tubman, the kids had either had to go to Baltimore or to um, College Park, Lakeland, to go to high school. We only had an elementary school. And fortunately for, for us, uh, it came just in time for our kids. But, um, you know, when, well, I came from Anne Arundel County, so I had to go to Annapolis to a high school. I went to uh, Wally H. Bates. So, um, and that, let's see, I'd get up at 7.30 in the morning. <laughs> I'd catch the bus at 7.30. And then I'd arrive at school about 10 minutes of 9, because that's how far we had to go. You know, we had to ride and pick up kids. So, of course, we came into the same situation, but my children didn't have that far to ride. They only had about, well, four or five miles. But uh, from where I live, it was 20-some miles we had to... Now, my understanding was that Tubman had some, uh, had a number of activities throughout the year which would, in, right. which would involve the whole community. Right. Remember some of those? Oh, yes. They had um, the banquet, which was would be the Howard County PTA banquet. That was the event of the year. Then uh, they also had a choir. The mm -hmm. PTA had mm -hmm. a choir. And, uh, of course, you know, you had the regular PTA meetings and things like that, but these were extra things that uh, brought the community together. And um, they, they had um, field days and things like that for the children, too, but the adults were mostly involved in the banquets and things like that. Now, you say, you say it brought the community together. Yes. Uh, that school seems to have had a really special place in this community for doing just that. It did, because it, it united the black community because um, there were people from Cooksville, Simpsonville, Guilford, uh, Ellicott City, North Laurel. They were, uh, we were all put together in that one school. So we, you know, got to know all the families from around the counties, uh, you know, from around the different neighborhoods in the counties. And that, um, it was very cohesive. Um, and very, we could support one another. How many of your children graduated from Tubman? Six. That was before integration. The uh, younger three graduated, two from um, Athelton and one from Howard. But the other six graduated from Harriet Tubman. Now, when integration came about, which was 64, right? I think it was, 64. something like that. Um, how did 
the people who had grown so close to Tubman feel about oncoming integration and how it would affect Harry Tubman? I don't know. I think it was mixed emotions. Uh, the, the main thing we thought about was the kids could have better um, access to books and, you know, it was so many things that, that Tubman didn't have. Uh, you know, we, the media system was not fully equipped. Uh, there, you know, and those were the kinds of things that we wanted the kids to have a broader area for their education because sometimes the books were handed down, you know, after the white schools finished with them. And then if uh, we needed books, then we had to wait because the money wouldn't be in the budget for the books for the black children, but they would have books at Howard High, and Howard High would have a gym that was out of this world, and you know, and the school, while it served a basic purpose, it didn't have all of the things that Howard High had, so our kids, you know, didn't have the advantages, and we saw that as an advantage to, uh, you know, let them go to uh, Howard. High. And then, of course, um, we found out that Harriet Tubman really wasn't all it was supposed to be because as soon as they integrated the schools, uh, they wouldn't send white children to Harriet Tubman. It wasn't good enough. So they built Athelton. Uh, when I was speaking with Ms. Cornelison yesterday about this subject, as a matter of fact, she said that. Um, Evidently, it had been expected that that as the as the black students were going to the white schools, the white students would come to the black schools as well, and then it didn't turn it out. It didn't that turn out that way. No, we had a, a superintendent, uh, John Yingling, a very very prejudiced superintendent, uh, and when we would have um, graduations at Harriet Tubman, all the members of the school board would come. I think there were perhaps five. I remember Mrs. Christ, uh, Mary Hovitt, and John Yingland, Mr. Murphy. Mm -hmm. I can't think of who the fifth one was. But anyway, they would all come, and they'd be on the stage. So it would always be sort of, uh, you know, not a, a, a real bet, but, you know, we'd be sitting there and say, well, bet you this year he doesn't pass out the diplomas because he didn't want to touch the black kids' hands. Mm -hmm. So he would just <laughs> sit up on the stage and look very important, you know. So it always became one of their lots to give the children the, the diplomas as they came up on the stage. He never gave them any. Mr. Charlie Miller, he would yeah. always Yeah, oh, and Mr. Miller, Mr. Miller, Charles Miller, he, he was he was one that. of the members yeah. of the board. But um, but when they integrated the schools, they never sent a white child to Tubman. They closed it immediately. I remember another fear that, uh, that Alice said was that um, even if it had been integrated, Tubman had been integrated, that there was a fear, and, and tell me if you have any reflections on this, that there was a fear that um, that the really good teachers that Tubman had would be sent to the white schools, and the bad, and, and then Tubman would receive mm -hmm. yes, the bad white yes, teachers. Right. Yes, yes, yes. This was mm -hmm. true. We would still get the short mm -hmm. end of the stick, regardless of, of uh, how it came down. That we would still suffer. Now Tubman opened in like forty. Wow. Forty eight. Right? I can't mm -hmm. remember exactly when it opened. Because, see, my kids didn't start to go into Tubman when it was first opened because my kids were still in elementary school. So I'm not sure about the opening day. For some, some reason, I think 48 sticks in my mind, or 49, 48, something like that. And then, of course, it closed in 64. Um, now, the f was Silas Craft the first principal? Yes. yes Silas was principal. the first principal. Now, uh, now you both uh, are know Silas Craft very mm -hmm. well. Um, mm -hmm. Tell me about Silas Craft. What kind of man he is and mm. what he's done for the county. <laughs> wow. Silas was very forceful. Mm. He was he's the so only good. person, black or white, that would stand up to John Yingling. Uh, he, 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 Woodson, and Flurry were the main ones to uh, get 
Tubman for the black community. Silas was the uh, principal, and uh, he would stand toe-to-toe -to, -toe to John England. And he, he was a very aggressive young man, and uh, he just didn't take no for answers. Whatever he went after, he, he stayed with it until he got it. And of course, I think, I think uh, some of the uh, members of the school board, I'm sure, they didn't like him. And so he wound up finally getting a transfer. He went to Montgomery County and taught there. Because uh, he just couldn't get along with the board, that's all. Of course, they yeah. demoted him when he went to uh, Montgomery, Montgomery County. County. They gave him an assistant yes. principalship. Yes. You know, so they had problems there, too. And eventually he went to Kansas, I think. And then came back to Maryland. Was that right? Mm -hmm. Now, when he went to Montgomery County, was he also in a black school down there? It was integrated. Mm -hmm. Blair. Mm -hmm. Blair. Senior high. Blair. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. But uh, he went there as an assistant principal. Oh. Well, tell me what your children have gone on to do since, uh, since graduating from Tubman. Hmm. Let's start at the top. The oldest was a Korea man in the Army, but he was killed in the uh, automobile accident 13 years ago. So he was a staff sergeant. Um, he had one daughter, and she has a daughter. Then the second son, Charles, he's in the business with us. He and has. He was in the Army. Yes, he was in the Army also. See, four of our sons were in the Army. Two were in Vietnam together. And okay, so that's Charles. Charles was married and has seven children. The next is James. Everybody calls him Frankie. He um, works at John Hopkins. Now we can't say what that what he does. He has high security clearance there, so it's top secret. Whatever he does up there. It's, that whatever he has, um, he's married. He has two sons. One son's in uh, the University of Maryland. I think this is his third year. And then he has another son who's a chef at the Hilton in Beltsville. And that brings us down to the oldest daughter, who's Arthenia. She's the, um, I guess you might say, the school buff. She's has been going to school all of her life. She um, has a doctorate from Cornell in plant physiology. She's taught at uh, Michigan State, Morgan State University. Well, she taught at Morgan State University first. Then she went to Cornell to get her doctorate. Then she went to Michigan State to teach for two years. Now she's at Richmond, and uh, she's an assistant professor there and a research professor. She's still in plant physiology. Which brings us now to Stanley, who is getting married on the 26th of this month. <laughs> uh, and uh, he works He's here in, in the business. company. He works with us. Then there is Arletta. Arletta is uh, married. She has two children. And she teaches at Appleton. She's a science teacher. She's been at Appleton about 12 years. And um, then it comes down to Philip. Philip works with the company. He's married. He has three children, and they're 13, 11, and 4. And um, that brings us down to Cynthia. Cynthia lives in Chicago. She's a social worker. She has a master's degree in social work. But she went to Chicago, and she didn't like being in social work anymore, so she's now in law school. She graduates from that the 5th of June of this year. So her husband, she and her husband, they don't have any children. Her husband is um, personnel director for uh, Standard Oil. That brings us down to Valerie, who you saw here. She's um, married. She has three sons. Her husband is a career man in the service. And that's all nine of them. She works in the company. And she works in the company. Now, all nine of the children went to college, but the four girls graduated. The four boys, the five boys, they just went for a year or two, and they that was it. <laughs> Why was that? I don't 
don't know. No. I, you know, I've tried to figure that out. Why those boys, they always, they still tell me, Mom, you know, one of these days I'll probably go back and finish. But, you know, and I always ask them, is it going to be before I die? <laughs> so I don't know yeah, why the they one, didn't. The one next to the oldest son, he, he uh, took up nursing. Yeah. He was a nurse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that but one. But he didn't finish. He's only nine credits short of graduating. Mm -hmm. But he didn't finish. Huh. Think he'll go back and finish? <laughs> no, no, no I don't think Charles so. is, no. Mm -mm. Charles mm -mm. is not going to go back. Mm -mm. I don't think any of them. Yeah, it, oh. it is so close, you know. And, um, yeah, he took up nursing. That's big demand for nursing. It is, it mm -hmm. is. Big demand. Yeah. Right. We'll change tapes real quick. Good. It's in the county or, or near the county um, that people remember taking part in years ago. Uh, one of them was uh, Emancipation Day. Do, do you remember Emancipation Day? Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. yes. Well, that was always in, in law. It was a fair that was held always in law in a place called the Grove. That was in the black community. And um, the people uh, around that time used to come from everywhere to this emancipation uh, uh, program that they'd have. And it was the type of thing that you could go and eat and meet friends, relatives, and, and what, what not. And um, at evening after the uh, day's program, they'd have a band there, and after the band, after the day's program was over, then they would stay to dance at night. And it was at this time. Much of it in, in, uh, in Columbia. And but it uh, it never bothered me. I mean, you know, I knew when it was nothing but farm and woods. I knew, you know, when it, these highways they had now wasn't there. They, I was, they rerouted 29 and like that, thing like that. There's one mm -hmm. thing that a lot of people don't know, and our daughter was the first black to live in Columbia. She was in the uh, in the apartment on Green Mountain Circle. And uh, I heard one time that, you know, somebody was saying it was somebody else, but it wasn't. It was uh, the one that's doctor, that has a doctorate from Cornell. She moved there, and um, we were, she had just graduated from college, and she had promised she'd stay home one year, and then she was going to move out on her own. And that was where she moved to uh, Columbia, Bryant Gardens, that's where it was. And, um, you know, I was kind of nervous about her, you know, she was black, and alone and she moved over there but there was an elderly white lady that lived under her and she took care of her she made sure you know that she was safe at all times she would look out for her. and uh, that made us feel good did you ever visit, visit the apartment oh yes yeah. yes oh, i yeah. practically lived there <laughs> to make sure she was all right <laughs> Did you think to yourself the first time she said, I'm, I'm moving to Columbia and I'm the only... Well, I, I wouldn't say what I thought because she had told me that in a year she was going to stay home one year and she was going to move out. And uh, I, I never was the type of mother that wanted to hold on to a child once they grew up. I thought, you know, they should be on their own. If that was what she wanted, it was what I wanted. So I never let her know that, you know, I was afraid for her over there or anything, even though I was. <laughs> you were? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Why? Well, she was the first girl I had, you know, and um, this was a new experience to move over there. You would have to see Columbia to, I mean, it was nothing but woods, and here was this one little apartment complex set up in all these, sitting up in all these woods, and here she was going over there, you know, to live. And um, I could handle the daytime, but the nights, you know, you thought, gee, what's, what's going to happen? Howard County uh, wasn't uh, integrate, you know, and you just weren't comfortable. How, how did your neighbors feel about, about Columbia coming and what they felt it might do for, for the black community and for the, for the old way that Howard County was before Columbia? 
How did, how did everybody feel about that? What's, what's the general consensus? There was some resentment among some people, mm -hmm. and some people didn't care one way or the other. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, it was just a, you know, something was going to happen. But um, I tell you, um, today I, you know, I don't feel the same. I, I have a lot of friends in Columbia, and I like Columbia, but uh, I know that some parts of the county suffer because of Columbia. Um, as far away as we are, you know, we feel some of the effects of some of the things they do, and they're not good effects, you know. Um, Can you illustrate any of those? Right now, mm -hmm. I could. Right now, I want to. <laughs> I want to add a garage onto my house, and they've come up with some of the weirdest things. They said we are in a flood area, and they've. I know, I know, and you you wouldn't believe what we are going through to get a permit to attach a, a garage to a house we've lived in for forty years. And the only water that's ever been on is when it rains. So, you know, uh, you know, but these are some of the weird things that they've, you know, come up with now. Uh, then on the other hand, a builder can come in and put up something. Uh, there's a house just down the street. When they come out the front door, they're going to walk into the street. And... Uh, it, so is this considered Columbia here then? Oh, it, we're getting, when you get down to 175, uh, that mall down there is now called Columbia Eastgate. Mm -hmm. There was a man, he's passed now, has a glass place on the corner. Columbia Glass Company, you know? So uh, it's just creeping around, and so mm -hmm. we're getting, mm -hmm. you know, it's expanding. And yeah, it's you know, and, and I, I sort of suspect that they're trying to uh, push us out or something or other. Because push us out or pull us in. <laughs> yeah, you know, because they, it's restrictions that doesn't make any sense. Well, let, me, let me ask you about, um, about the community of... Uh, let's get two shots. Thank you. Uh, the community of Savage and its relationship to, to blacks in the area. Uh, tell me about Savage. Well, Savage has changed, you know. It's not like it used to be years ago. There, were, there was a time when my family had to go from this area where we lived on, down on uh, Mission Road and used to have to walk to Savage to store. And you, they weren't allowed in the Savage. They would stone them, run them, you know. My brothers, they would run them out of there, stone them. And used to be real hostile towards black. Mm. But now it's different. You, you know, you can go anywhere in, in the Savage, and you might meet a few like that. They still have that same attitude, but not too many. At least they don't, they don't show it no more like that. Why was that? Do you know? Well, they just didn't like blacks. That's all I can say. <laughs> that's all I can say. It, it goes, yeah, you know, I guess it just goes back to uh, a way a person is taught, you know, because when the kids, when the schools were integrated, you know, you had white kids trying to find black kids' tails and, you know, mm -hmm. simple, stupid things, you know, because they, I, I don't know how they would come up with this kind of stuff you know, nonsense, but it was it was comical, you know, in a sense. And, uh, but it, and I guess they just told uh, the kids you don't associate with a black because it was, you know, you had to be careful, they might attack you or something like that. And I guess the kids believed it. And, um, and I remember when I started volunteer work at Perkins State Hospital, I was the only, there were two of us, uh, blacks that went to the T and I stayed to volunteer and I volunteered there for about 20 years and uh, there was this elderly lady and one day she walked up to me and she put her hand on my she said oh your skin is soft and she thought I was hard because I'm brown you know and uh, then there was another one um, uh, Ellen 
I saw her at the, the Safeway store one day, and uh, but I didn't say anything to her. So eventually, she, you know, she walked up to me and she said, "Why aren't you speaking?" And I said, "We aren't allowed to speak to you all when you're in public." And she said, "Why?" And I said, "Don't you know?" And she said, "No." And I said, "Well, it's an unwritten law." that uh, you all will talk to us when we are in your homes or when there's no other whites around, but when you get around other white people, you don't speak. She said, well, I never heard of such a ridiculous thing in my life. <laughs> and I said, well, this is the way it is. And uh, we went through many experiences like that. In fact, you remember the time uh, they locked uh, Junior and they locked Long. up, Long. They locked yeah. up um, our oldest son, and a nephew and two other cousins in law when they first opened the law shopping center and it was on a Saturday and these boys they were like 16 and 17 years old they were in Laurel and I got a call and the police said that they had arrested these boys so we went down they were in jail and the reason they were in jail was because this man from Georgia was there he had been walking on the sidewalk and he didn't want them on the sidewalk. He wanted them to walk in the street. And they, you know, they were just teenagers. They didn't know anything about walking in the street. So uh, because they wouldn't walk in the street, he called the police and they locked them up. So then we all had to go down for a trial. They, you know, when we went down, they released them right away. But then they had a trial. And of course he had to take off from work and the other kids, the fathers did too. And the, you know, mothers and fathers went down there. And uh, so then he was especially angry with my son because he said my son looked at him, well, our son, like he wanted to cut his throat. So the judge said, well, how can you tell by somebody's looks that they wanted to cut your throat? And he said, case dismissed. But, uh, you know, it, it, those were the kinds of things that, um, it's, isn't it stupid? But uh, if those were the things there that... There may not be as much racial prejudice in the county today as it was years ago, but it still exists. It still exists. It's still here Subtle. in, in Howard County. Yes. Yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it's nothing you put your hand on. A few days ago, you heard about uh, uh, Turk Valley. See, that's... Uh, um, something they're going to lose a yeah. lot of business. Yeah, yeah. because of yeah, that. A lot of business but you, you know, um, I went into Giant Monday, and um, there was a white couple and myself, and just as we, we both got to the seafood counter together, and uh, there was a white boy waiting there, and uh, he looked at me, and you know, he gave me one of those looks, you know, as, you know, what are you doing here or something like that, you know? And uh, he just sort of glanced over at me like that and then looked at the white cup. He said, may I help you? <laughs> you know? And uh, so I, I just left. I, you know, I said, well, I wouldn't get I did want shrimp, but I, did. I went to another store and got it. Because you can't put your hand on it, but you see it. Did, did you experience things like that even even more 40 years ago oh, oh yes. yes oh no, yes it was much worse mm -hmm. then uh you know mm -hmm. there wasn't there wasn't any covering up then you mm -hmm. know they didn't people didn't cover it up at all then remember any specific incidences that stick out in your mind well you know that they had separate facilities for black and white you know of course that's you know been done away with how you go to the doctor's office uh we go down to Dr. Warren's in Laurel and they had a place that I guess it was big enough to hold a desk and maybe two or three chairs and you know, just to show you the size of it and uh, so that's where the black people would sit and the, the white people would have a nice big lounge you know they'd have two or three sofas out there leather sofas and <laughs> chairs and they could be sitting out there waiting until they were called and of course you never knew whether you were called in turn or whether you know they saw all the white people first and then got to you because see you were back in that little room so you didn't know whether you know you were number 10 or number 20 and that's you know and those are the kind of things 
uh, that was in law. Now, I must say in Savage, which was strange, Dr. Frank Shipley did not run his office that way. He had uh, it in his living room, and blacks and whites sat together, and you did get called on as you came in there. Now, Dr. Frank Shipley was different, and that was in Savage. That was strange. Yeah, that's very strange. Mm -hmm. Wow. It was. Why didn't I have a gym? Oh, oh wait. Um, yeah, it's just, you know, too shy. It's, it's just so hard for me to, to I mean, I'm, I'm a product of my time. You're right. And, and, and I guess in this particular instance that, that's good because it's just so hard for me to, under, to, to realize that there are signs that say you can't go here mm -hmm. because you're whatever, whether it's black, mm -hmm. white, pink, mm -hmm. or a certain religion or whatever. It's, I have a really hard time relating to that. Right. And I mean, to actually walk up to a door, no matter what it leads to, and to see that it's restricted based on a color or whatnot mm -hmm. uh, is, is so hard for me to fathom. Uh, do you actually remember walking and seeing oh these things? Oh, you couldn't oh go in restaurants. Yes. Uh, you know, we didn't know what it mm -hmm. was to be able to go into a restaurant and have so dinner. <laughs> you had to go yeah. around the back door. Um, to And look, and it's still, you can go down here on Route 1. And there are places like, uh, of course, pools is closed now, but these are, these are, uh, I guess you would call them, what do you call them, beer gardens? I don't know what you mm. call them now. But you could go, because, and I know this is a fact, because some of our men will go to this place, would go to this place to cash their checks. And what they do, they charge you a dollar for a hundred, on a hundred. So if you your check is three hundred dollars, you have to pay a dollar. A dollar and all the change. And all you the change. To, all the change. See now, if you had a, if it was, if your check was three hundred and ninety nine dollars, uh, you know, three hundred dollars and ninety nine cents. They'd keep the ninety nine cents, and you pay three dollars and ninety nine cents. Plus, you could not go in the main area. They always had to be outside in the yard. Now mm. there is. Um, and and I know it was a fact because they won and they would be so anxious to cash those checks until one day they cashed one that Sam forgot to sign. <laughs> and Mr. Poole called and uh, he said, uh, uh, I have a check down here that been, hasn't been signed. And how soon can you get down here to, to uh, sign it? And I said, I will be there when I can. If you hadn't been so fast to catch it, cashing it, you would have noticed it wasn't signed. And I took my time. But, you know, I had to go in the little back door to go sign this check for him. So it's it's still right here on Route 1. Uh, there is a place right there by um, that place that has the concrete pump where you use uh, well, I don't something know. or other. Well, I don't, I don't know. Right they're there going, where the stair going. place. No, they're, they're, they're going in there now. Yeah, they're, they're going, going in there. But, you know, that was... Used to call it redneck, redneck country. <laughs> <laughs> I, I tell you, I, yeah. I don't think we uh, we know it exists. We know that racial prejudices still exist in the county, and not only in the county but everywhere. But I don't know what we help help it a lot. I don't know what we help the conditions by talking about it so much. You know, we know it exists, but I don't know whether we are helping it or whether we are hindering it to smooth out and, and you know, come together like it ought to be. I don't know. I, I think it'll always I hate, be. I hate to keep drilling upon it. I, I really do. I hate to keep drilling upon it. I know it's here, and I know you have to do something about it every time it pops up, but I just hate to talk about it too much. I really do. No, I understand your point. I do. I see your point. Um, getting back to what do you think? Pool? Mm -hmm. the, the P double O L E? Double O. Yeah, Norris Pool. Norris Pool. Yeah. What kind of a business was it? He had uh, it's it's. Well, he's, it he's must have been a restaurant now because he sold it. But it used to be, it evidently was a restaurant, and he had cabins all around. I guess at some point in time it was a very flourishing business for him and uh, then this was a little side thing for him you know would be to cash the checks and to sell the, the whiskey and beer and stuff to the blacks on the outside they could congregate all out there in the yard uh, you know uh, 
and drink all they wanted, but they couldn't come in. They could only go in a certain part. They couldn't go in the main part. Oh, well, I don't know because I never went there. No, I, I know never. Where I went. went there to sign that check, I and I. How long ago was that? The check signing. Oh, that's. Well, a couple about, of years. About, yeah, about two or three years ago. Oh, oh that's shit. shocking! Like thirty years oh, ago. No, oh no! Uh, no! No! Uh uh! No! Uh uh! And. Um, but I think that that eventually they they went in in the main part and sat down. Did they? Yeah. Maybe so. with mm, about a year, just mm, a year or so, mm. because he sold it now to someone yeah. else. But uh, this is the type of thing. And and you'd be surprised, like, sometimes you go into the store, and you go in with a check. Or you can go with a $50 bill. Now, I've had this happen to me. You can go in with a $50 bill, and the girl at the cash register says, oh, wait a minute, I'll have to go and get this change because I don't have that kind of change in the cash register. And you know that makes no sense at all that she doesn't have change, but you know they have to take it and check it because they don't believe you have a $50 bill. It could be a counterfeit or why do you have a $50 bill? You know, and so, uh, and, it, and, it, and it is, it's gotten to me right now, if I have a $50 bill, I won't take it to a store. I'll go to the bank and, and break it up first. And, you know, and I really shouldn't do that. I shouldn't have to feel that way. Let me ask you this. There's a, there's a humorous story I want you to, to tell me again. Uh, we'll just have a bus shot of uh, the name. Let me get her name right. The Dorothy Conway, who, uh, oh. will you tell me that story about <laughs> soliciting for the church anniversary or something? Yes. Uh, Dorothy belongs. She's deceased now. But Dorothy belonged to Asbury Church, and they were going around. They were having uh, anniversary services for the church. So they were going around inviting all the people in the neighborhood to come to this church for the anniversary. And she went up to Maple Village, and um, she was knocking on the door, and she knocked on one door, and she invited this man to uh, her church. And he asked her, he said, do you know who I am? And uh, she said, no. And he said, <laughs> I'm the Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. <laughs> so Dorothy, Dorothy stood there and looked at him. She said, well, you're invited too. <laughs> she said she was scared to death. She didn't know what to do. She said, <laughs> but it was really funny, you know, the way she could tell it. She says, well, you're invited too. <laughs> Of course, he didn't come. <laughs> no, I don't think so. I'm glad he didn't bring any of his friends. I'm going to tell you. <laughs> I love that story. I laughed so hard when I heard that on the tape. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Dorothy would laugh at that for two. It was comical. Tell me, did, did, uh, I, I don't know of any, of any uh, Ku Klux Klan activity in the county. Were you aware of any at all? We did have one. Was it? Do you there remember was an that night? I don't know. Just a few weeks ago, there was an incident that happened down here in Law. That is, somebody burned a cross. Yeah, right. On up. somebody's on the uh, um, Lomax. Phil Lomax. Phil Lomax. Phil and Mary Lomax. Yeah. Uh, Phil used to be the bus driver for uh, Harriet Tubman. He used mm -hmm. to carry our kids, and they burned a cross on his front yard. That's been about been about it's two or three weeks ago. Yes, yeah, just recently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we had somebody come across here one night and threw a, a Molotov cocktail, I guess that's what they call it, in the yard. You remember that's Charles right, jumped, yes, in the, yes, jumped in the so. car and he tried to catch him and we were trying to catch him so he wouldn't catch them. <laughs> in the 60s. Yeah, so, uh, the 60s, yeah we did started, have yeah. little things like that to happen. And, yeah. uh, wow. and then, uh, you know, the kids used to have problems. Uh, on the school buses, you know, um, there was one white girl, I can't think of the, her name, but Valerie was saying just the other day, she saw her in the store, and she said, aren't you Valerie Moore? And she said, yes. And she said, oh, she said, you must come to see me sometimes. And Valerie said, I had to look at her because she used to always call me a nigger, <laughs> and now she wants me to come and visit her. So, you know, things change. Uh, you know, the kids grow up. And I think if they are let alone, then they start to evaluate people one on one. Uh, and you know, I think everybody realizes you have all kinds of people. That and then too, I think when you are educated, you learn to reason things out. 
uh, and and if you notice, uh, most people, if they follow through on a lot of uh, racial slurs and and uh, actions, you'll find that they're not really educated people. They uh, have fallen short in that area, and they need to do those types of things to make themselves feel uh, a little above what they. Well, they just don't think, feel good about themselves, so they try to pull you down by using those kind of tactics. And uh, so yeah. we haven't had that. That's true. Reverend Moore, let me ask you about um, um, about the church. The church seems, when I interview everyone, the, church, the, the importance of the church in a community seems to be so, so very profound mm -hmm. to the black community. Mm -hmm. It's my own personal opinion, but I think even more so than it is to the white community today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, why is that? Well, the church has been the only institution where blacks could go, could gather, and to solve or talk about their problems. The church in the black community is the institution, I say, that has kept and has brought the black community together. So we've had no other place to go but to the church. And, and this is why it says it's very important in the black community, in the church. That's way out of that. Now, you're still an active preacher, yes? Yes. Mm -hmm. Which denomination? Baptist. Baptist. Mm -hmm. And where do you preach? Elk Ridge. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. Unity Baptist. Unity Baptist. Unity Baptist. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, is that are you raised as well as Baptist? Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. When mm -hmm. when you were young, did did your family uh, 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 always attend church? Or? When yes, when young in my very younger days, I my family was Methodist and we, we uh, always attended the Methodist church. But when it was after I got married uh, that I uh, I uh, became a Baptist. I joined the Baptist and, and, and I became a Baptist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I uh, wanted to ask you something else about the church experience. What was that now? Oh, it seems um, uh, many years ago that uh, when, when the schools were still uh, desegregated or, or rather segregated, uh, that many of the black schools were connected very closely with the, church. the churches. Mm -hmm. And why, 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 did that, why was that? Well, I think that um, this is, again, is the only places that we had to go to get vital information and, and uh, get, well, they were being brought together between these two institutions, the church and the schools. Yeah, from that we got all the kind of information that we needed to know how to live and how to adjust in the society in where we live, in which we live. So, Could I, yeah. you know, you didn't have anywhere to have a meeting. Mm -mm. Uh, you know, that that was it. Um, Guilford had, a, well, not only Guilford, but all around Maryland, you found the little three-room uh, schools. And uh, you could tell that was a black school. It was a little three-room area, you know, and uh, it went as far as the seventh grade, and that's as much as you could do. But the church was the meeting place, and if you wanted an announcement to get out to people, you could always count on the church to get it out. You, you know, you would, it was where you had your weddings, your funerals, your suppers, or everything mm -hmm. was... Uh, uh, your political meetings, everything. It was the only place that you could find that we could uh, have, you know, to get together. And as I said, we didn't couldn't go to restaurants to get any, you know. So no, we no meetings at the restaurants. No, and you couldn't get any meals at the restaurants. <laughs> so I guess that's why we had big church suppers and watermelon feast and. Uh, Oh, they just had all kinds of things. They had camp meetings, and those were the kinds of things that kept the community together. And uh, it's still that type of thing that uh, exists among the black churches, mm -hmm. still. 
Uh, if you want something to get out into community, you give it to the black church, and it goes. Yeah, that, that certainly seems to be, be evident. Mm -hmm. Now, Reverend Warren, let me, let me ask you about something, and I want you to be free to talk with me about this or not, because I, I understand you may have some reservations about this, and it concerns the story of Topsy. Yeah. Now, can you, we, can you and will you tell me about, about Topsy? <laughs> so, <laughs> the only thing that I knew about her is that I used to see her. I was kind of young then. I used to see her. She used to work for some people or live with these people uh, on Mission Road. And the names were Combs. And I used to see her sometime in the evening, and sometime you see her in the morning, in the yard, feeding the chickens and doing other little odds and ends. But she stayed there. She had nowhere else to go as I know of, no family as I know of. She stayed there with these people and, uh, and in the home, I think, she stayed in the house with them and the house with them. And um, she'd always be around and uh, them, you know, they didn't seem to have no home or no people. And cause you couldn't talk to her, cause you couldn't get up close enough to talk to her. She'd see you coming, she'd leave, she'd go. And that's about as much as I know about her. So I don't know. With what you do know about her, strictly based on what you know about her, not trying to infer anything, does it almost seem that she lived the life of a modern-day slave? Well, you put it that way. I guess so. I guess so. She was always there. And you see her in the yard, feeding chickens, cutting wood, and bringing in wood, and... I think they had a cow, a couple of cows or something. I think they had a cow, these people did. But anyhow, you, 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 it was always, you could always say she was almost like, just like you say, Martin Day Slave. In my opinion, You know, there was. was a lady at Dorregan Manor. You know where Dorregan Manor is? Uh, Up off of, I is it Folly Quarter? Manor Lane, isn't it? Yeah. Across the Carrolls. Yeah. You know, there's an old uh, plantation. Dorigan Manor, and I used to work for the county back in the 60s and uh, organizing adult basic education classes, and they had a lady up there that was a slave, and she didn't leave. Now, I, don't know, I don't know when she passed or whether she's still living or not, but I remember going there, and she was in the kitchen. They had a slave kitchen with all these pots and pans down there, and she talked about Missy, how she waited on Missy. And I can, for the life of me, remember her name, but this lady loved it there. She wouldn't go anywhere else. I can't think of her name, but now this was at Dorregan Manor, and this was in the 60s. Wow, that's, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. I wonder if it's possible that she's a descendant of uh, on the on the county the Carrolls have owned that property for a couple mm -hmm. hundred years. Mm -hmm. Charles mm -hmm. Carroll, Carrollton was right. his Right. Yeah. I wonder if it's a descendant of uh, families that they had once. It could, it, it, it could have been. Be, yeah. But I I do remember when we went there, uh, Missy was upstairs, and she was asleep, and she was that's all she talked. She called her Missy. Now who Missy was I don't know, but uh, you know they have their own chapel and everything right there on the plantation. But those were in the 60s. This lady that used to live with the Crohn's, all I knew of her, her name is that they called her Topsy. You think you all named her Topsy because you didn't know who she was? I, I, I don't know where the name came from. Then. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where the name came from, but that's the name that uh, I always knew her by, Topsy. I think there is a either a play or an opera or something based on um, Uncle Tom's Cabin, the book, mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. is called Topsy and Eva. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's the reason I'm wondering mm -hmm. if that's why mm -hmm. they called her Topsy. I don't, I don't really know. Because that was one of like the that. books I read when I was a child. I wonder. Mm -hmm. I wonder. Is, is there a character in the? Because I've never read the book. Is there a character in the book named Topsy? Named Topsy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sounds like that's the yeah. connection, doesn't it? Yeah. At least it's easy to assume. Yeah. That's uh -huh. 
Now, you seem to be the only surviving person who uh, <laughs> at least admits that. to remembering <laughs> that, that person, I think. Is that right? Well, Robert, oh, no. Robert it Coleman. Well, Robert Coleman. There people right Robert here on this Coleman. corner. Yeah. Robert Coleman. But see, Helen. On the Mission Road. Yeah, but Helen didn't live Helen in this did. area. Helen come from Simpsonville, so she may not have known. Oh, he, he had Robert, passed. But Robert. Had he passed? No, Alice Cornelison talked to Robert about oh, it, she? I think. Uh-huh. Oh, so yeah. that's how we figured out that the two of you might know what you're talking about. Uh, uh, <laughs> but Robert I remembered it. I think it was Robert Coleman. Yeah. Uh-huh. It's an amazing story, it really is. Mm-hmm. Because, because you saw her during what years? Yes, that's in the uh, 60s, early 60s, and let's see, back farther than that. Uh, 58, 59. I, I know it's in. I know it's in the fifties and the sixties, like that. Uh, in between there. Mm, amazing. And, and there's something interesting about uh, uh, when she died and, and and burying her or something. I don't know nothing about uh, that. Guess. Now, where did that part of the story come from? Uh, maybe it came from Mr. Coleman. Uh, something about uh, when she finally passed away. Uh, her keeper, owner, or whatever you wish to call him, uh, took her to uh, where? To, to, the, to, the, to, to the local church, the Guilford Baptist Church, is that? Now I don't know. I don't, I don't know. know. I don't remember that. I don't know. They said, uh, would, you, would you please, can, can, can I bury her here? And they turned her away and they said, uh, they said no, you've kept her from black people all her life. Um, it's. You tell me something. It might have been Robert, I don't remember but, that. Um, but you we have been from black people our whole life that, that mm-hmm. you will you will deal with her on, on your own now. Don't come to us now mm-hmm. when she's dead when we could have helped her in life and whatnot and, mm-hmm. and turn her over to us as, you know, an empty corpse. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh, and, and he had to bury her elsewhere. And I don't know. Mm-hmm. I, I must have been Robert. I don't remember that part. Yeah, I don't remember I that so. part either. I guess mm-hmm. so. I know that was, it was in Alice's book. And, mm-hmm. But I don't remember where she got that information from. It's just an amazing story. Definitely. Mm-hmm. Let me see if I'm out of questions. Uh, I think I am. Yes, I certainly am. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very, very much. Okay. Really mm-hmm. appreciate it. Let's see, how do I turn this thing off here? <laughs> Stop looks good. Stop looks good.